Hi, I'm Barb Elam, Associate Director of Visual Media Resources and Study Collection Librarian at Bard Graduate Center. And I'm here with Preston Singletary. Preston is a Seattle-based glass artist who has earned international recognition for work that fuses the traditions of European glass blowing with his native Clinkett cultural heritage. Singletary began working with glass in 1982, learning directly from other Seattle area glass artists, assisting on a production team at the Glass Eye Studio and faculty at Pilchuck Glass School. He also worked at the Kunstbach Art and Design School in Stockholm, Sweden, and with Venetian Glass Masters. Singletary maintains an active teaching and exhibition schedule, including frequent teaching at Pilchuck. Preston is responsible with artist David Svensson for initiating Pilchuck's Founders Totem Pole, which he made with Svensson and woodcarvers in Haynes, Alaska. The totem was made for Pilchuck's 30th anniversary and represents Pilchuck founders John Hoberg, Ann Hoberg, and Dale Chihuly. And incidentally, this summer, Preston will be teaching at Pilchuck's inaugural 50th anniversary session, which focuses on Indigenous artists in glass. Preston is here as part of our programming for Voices in Studio Glass History, Art and Craft, Maker in Place, and the Critical Writings and Photography of Paul Hollister. Preston, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Why don't we start at the beginning? What drew you to glass? Initially, it started as uh, more or less a day job, as I like to put it. Um, it, uh, I was fresh out of high school and age 19, I started blowing glass at, uh, in 1982. Uh, Dante Marioni got me a job there and he was working, uh, there on the production floor. And, um, as he put it, he w was hoping to, uh, you know, entice his friends to, uh, to take up glass blowing and, uh, and thereby he could build a team around, you know, all of us. You know, helping him. And uh, so, yeah, I started, uh, you know, there on the production floor and worked there for about three years till I started uh, working with uh, Benjamin Moore. Um, uh, the glass I kind of outgrew the studio space that it was at when I started on uh, South King Street in Seattle. And then Benjamin bought that building and he converted it, converted it into his own studio. And then I started working with him. And so I worked with Benjamin for about, uh, gosh, about, about 18 years or so. Um, and then, um, you know, it was, you know, developing my work on the side, going to Pilchuck and, uh, you know, kind of finding my own path, you know, with glass. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. You started your career making non-native glass work and eventually began creating pieces based on your Clinkett heritage. What compelled you to make that transition? Well, the early work that I did, of course, I was kind of following uh, the trends of uh, just, you know, glass blowing in general, uh, working with Dante quite closely uh, and Benjamin, you know, the work that I was doing was more influenced by design and classical forms. And, uh, you know, so it was about, you know, so from 82 till about 88, you know, I started going to Pilchuck and then around 88 is when I first kind of, uh, started to dabble in the, uh, the Clinkett designs, and which I, I didn't really know much about or what it was gonna to take to get into it, but I, I started um, practicing with a sandblasting technique, um, you know, drawing designs out on, on the work. And so I basically uh, was looking for my own voice with the material and I decided to look to my cultural background. And so once I did that, it really opened up a lot of doors for me. But it wasn't until um, from about 88 to say 95, after I got married, you know, life kind of got serious and so did I. So I, I decided to, um, um, I mean, and up until that point, I was playing music quite a bit. So I was trying to make it as a musician as well and blow glass during the day. That's why I say it was kind of a, a day job, so to speak. Um, and everybody knew that, but I really uh, had a great time working with all these people and just learning through practical experience. So that was uh, um, my my own personal experience. Um, and once I started, you know, working on the the native designs, I I really uh, it kind of transformed my thought process and everything uh, everything that I was doing in terms of uh, looking at objects that were more sculptural and decorative as far as the design, the surface design and what have you, and trying to understand the architecture of the, of the form line, 
uh, designs that make up Northwest Coast art. Um, and, you know, so I had to, I had to seek out mentors and, and uh, teachers to help me learn uh, the basics. And so once I did that, it, it basically gives you this vocabulary that uh, allows you to develop your own designs. Thank you. You mentioned, you just mentioned that you're a musician and you were thinking of pursuing music as a career before you fell into glass. Um, yeah. How does music inform your work as a glass artist? Well, I mean, uh, music has always been, you know, it's been like a constant balance throughout my life, you know, in terms of uh, just this thing that I love. Uh, I grew up playing piano and then I switched to guitar and eventually, you know, switched to bass. But, you know, music is a constant, you know, element, you know, when I'm working, you know, when we're blowing glass, we're often listening to music. And so um, we have uh, that sort of freedom to just, you know, to be, to, to you know, to explore. And uh, so, you know, it's just been a very, very much of a constant in my life. And, you know, when I'm having a, a bad day in the glass blowing studio, maybe I just, you know, focus on my music and vice versa. So that was something that um, kind of really um, kept me going. Um, and it's something that I still continue to do and, uh, and love very much. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, when most people that are not involved in glass hear the word glass artist, most people think of blowing. Um, but many of your works are made involving other techniques such as kiln forming. Could you talk a little bit about some of what those other techniques are? Yeah, so primarily what I do is, you know, blow glass and sculpt glass and then I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll design the surface and, and do the sandblasting process to give it the design work. Uh, but I also do uh, kiln formed glass, you know, it, it, when I was starting out and trying to develop my vocabulary of things that I could do, um, I, I, I started to look at other ways of forming glass and then the, the lost wax process really kind of jumped out. Uh, but in each case, when I do these, these kinds of pieces, I work collaboratively with uh, a wood carver and I'll design the totem or the object that's going to be, you know, carved in wood, um, and then send it out to basically a fabricator who um, does the lost wax process. And so I've 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 worked with um, Fire Art in Portland, uh, Oregon, and as well as uh, some of the glass makers in the Czech Republic. Uh, so through the introduction um, to the Czech. Um, the Czech artist was, it was Charlie Perriot who actually gave me my first glass blowing uh, uh, lesson. Uh, and he was one of the early uh, founders of the, uh, the glass eye. So, um, so we had this friendship going and I knew that he was uh, working in Czech Republic. So um, I was wanted to make uh, this totem pole. It was about seven and a half feet tall. And we were having a hard time finding someone who would be who was willing to kind of take the risk and try to make it. And so Charlie, I went to Charlie, and he he found somebody in the Czech Republic to do it. And so we made this seven and a half foot totem pole, and it was like two thousand pounds of glass, and and um, that was like uh, very, you know, that was kind of on a, on a, on a, the next level kind of thing for me. And and so um, the pieces you can see behind me are, were. Uh, fabricated in uh, in Portland, you know, the two posts on the side are, are actually uh, kiln cast forms. And then the uh, screen is actually uh, multi panels of glass. And then this mural is distributed across, you know, the multi panels and then cut and then sandblasted. So trying to, to um, you know, break into uh, more of a monumental um, approach to some of this stuff. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how I, I work with uh, the kiln form stuff today. Yeah, very cool, very, very cool. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about Benjamin Moore, um, who was of course very important to you and to Pilchuk. Could you talk a little bit about what you, you feel like that you learned from him? Oh gosh, you know, I mean, Benjamin was like, you know, it's kind of like a, 
I was just like a father figure to me in a lot of ways. I mean, he, he, uh, you know, he and I formed a really close friendship early on and, and I, you know, and I was his assistant. So I was assisting on the team, on his team. And at that time he was working with many, many different artists who would come to him and then we would make the work for him. It was like Dante Marioni and Richard Royal and Dan Daly and, uh, you know, um, gosh, Cappy Thompson and uh, Danny Perkins, all these, all these artists that would, would, would kind of cycle through the studio on a regular basis. And so I really got a, a pretty varied um, experience in terms of, uh, I don't know, sensibility and technique. And of course, you know, that combined with, with Benjamin's sense of, of perfection, you know, and, and, you know, glass blowing process was really, really crucial to me uh, because I was expected to, uh, you know, to understand how to work with all these different people. And so once you learn that, that uh, uh, approach or, you know, different people's approaches, then you, um, you know, kind of borrow like, you know, like a, a recipe when you're cooking, you know, <laughs> you understand, oh, I'm going to throw this little spice in there and you can you know, adapt a technique or a process to, you uh, to try to, you know, create your own vision. And so, um, you know, and then also just his, his level of, of um, I mean, the, the legacy that he brings to the community and the, you know, the, you know, the connection to the Italians and, uh, and Dale Chihuly and all of that stuff. It was just, you know, it was amazing, you know, process uh, to learn just, you know, by working with all these people. Thank you. Preston, I know that modernism has been really important to you, at least lately. Um, could you talk a little bit about modernism as a jumping point uh, for your work today? You know, um, so when I'm, you know, I didn't go to art school. So I basically, you know, started reading art books and, you know, trying to find something that would interest me. And, you know, I read something about the surrealists, you know, and, and, um, you know, their infatuation with uh, uh, so-called, you know, primitive art. And, you know, so that kind of opened up the doors to modernism and primitivism. And, you know, that was so just as a casual student of that and looking at books and reading, um, I became really infatuated with the whole idea of, of you know, at first, you know, modernism played into my work in terms of the, you know, the decorative art kind of side of modernism. Um, but then when I started to, you know, uh, find my own way and, and learn about primitivism, which was, you know, the modernists that were uh, looking at, you know, uh, primitive art or, you know, Native American art, oceanic art, African art, and then becoming inspired by that, there's a lot of there was a lot of uh, interesting dialogue going on, especially when I was trying to marry my own, you know, glass blowing process to my cultural background. And, you know, the fact is that Native American artists were always excluded from the modern art world. It was just not something that was, um, uh, it was just not the place for it. And yet the modernists figured out a way of becoming inspired by these, this, these objects and then Kind of synthesized it into a new uh, form and a new process, and so for me it was kind of like a reversal of that. You know, I was kind of looking at the modernists and then kind of you know getting back to my roots and then uh, adapting you know certain kinds of forms. Um, you know, a lot of some of the work that I do kind of spans between being very traditional looking or sometimes it's exaggerated in its scale and thereby sort of abstracted. So um, I would take like a small detail and make it larger and, you know, kind of pre present it as a sculptural object. But then, you know, there's ways of creating symbolism within the design work that I can kind of harken back to, you know, the cultural art and make it a raven or an eagle or a killer whale and what have you, or, or you know, 
you know, and then shifting into mythology was, you know, the, the next step for me, understanding the stories and understanding the, um, the, uh, uh, the symbolism and how to create these, uh, these forms in, you know, the context of the Northwest Coast design system. and how does glass lend itself to native imagery or narratives? Well, I think, you know, it, it brings a new dimension to indigenous art. Um, you know, it, it, when I just, you know, one of the first things that I discovered, you know, was one of these hat forms that, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a upside down hat. Um, traditionally, it's a, a Northwest Coast hat is sort of like a conical you know, basket. But if you flip it upside down, it becomes basically a bowl, which every glass blower has probably tried to make, you know, at least once in their, the beginning uh, of their uh, exploration of the material. And so I saw that as a bowl. And so I started to create the design work on it. And I'll tell you this funny story, because my aunt, you know, who was really excited about, uh, you know, me getting involved with you know, our cultural art, um, uh, because none of the family was really doing that kind of thing. So we had a holiday open house at Benjamin's studio. And so my aunt comes to see, you know, uh, just, you know, it's like a little afternoon, you know, come have a glass of champagne or a cup of coffee and see what we've got. And, you know, if you want to buy something for Christmas, well, you know, the art, the assistants, we usually have a card table over in the corner and Benjamin has this, you know, beautiful showroom with all these nice pedestals and lights and stuff, you know, above the pedestals. And my aunt said, well, can we put the hat on this pedestal? Uh, and just to see it, because I had this, this cobalt blue hat form with the design work on there. And so I said, sure. So we took Benjamin's piece down and we, I put the, the hat down uh, on the pedestal and about 10 people had gathered around to see what I was doing. And then when I put it up on the, on the pedestal and the, the shadows kind of came through and projected onto the, you know, the top side of the pedestal and everybody's like, oh, look at that. And I, you know, and I said, well, yeah, that's what I do. That's what I intended all along. You know, that was, you know, so that was like the aha moment, right? So. Um, that was uh, what really showed me that, okay, there's, there's another dimension to this piece. And it's sort of like, you know, discovering the petroglyph when the sun's like shooting through this little crack in the, you know, uh, you know, in, in the rock and then, then you see it, you know? And so that's what's got me started. And that is, so from there, I, I kept, you know, pushing and um, uh, trying to uh, discover new ways of uh, interpreting the forms. And, you know, it, it, there's nothing like the material of glass. I mean, it has this luminous quality. It has, uh, you know, uh, a sense of permanence. It has a sense of fragility. You know, the potential for it to last for thousands of years is, 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 a, is a possibility or it could break if it hits the ground, you know? I mean, so there's this really interesting dichotomy with, um, with the material. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what I, I think about glass and indigenous uh, cultures. Great, thank you. Um, this question, um, you, you partially answered in the, in the last question, but I was gonna ask you, um, many of the glass pieces you create are reinterpreted versions of objects used for shamanistic or ritualistic purposes. What changes when these pieces become objects of contemplation? Well, you know, I, I, I like to, um, that kind of dovetails into the idea of mythology. So, um, you know, at, there's ways of uh, interpreting uh, moments in a story that can be captured in an art object. So, um, you know, so uh, the, uh, some of the, you know, bone amulet forms or the tooth forms or uh, these, these things that I, you know, these forms that I work with, um, they're, they're kind of like small talisman or charms, you know, like the types of things that like I'm wearing one of them. This is like a little, piece of jade actually that I carved uh, when I was in New Zealand. 
but in any case, sometimes I'll make it on a larger scale and then it becomes like this gestural form, which harkens to, you know, back to the modernism, but it also references the kind of the spirituality of the, of the community as well. These things that um, are kind of like connect, you know, connecting humans to uh, the supernatural realm, uh, the way I think about it. It, you know, in the old days, you know, uh, one of these kind of charms might might uh, have a significance, you know, it, it would help connect the, the, the individual to um, the supernatural world, the spirit world, or spirit helpers. And so that's, that's why I, 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 I talk about it in that way. Because there is, um, you know, it, it, for the longest time, I, I always thought of myself as uh, something, you know, you know I'm, I'm Native American, I'm Filipino, I'm all these ethnicities. And then I went, to, uh, I went to Europe to live there for six months and I felt very, very American, right? So when I, you know, when I come back, you know, I'm, I'm it expanded my perspective of the world. And so I was really determined at that point to try to make a difference with my work and sort of have become one of these people that, uh, you know, that is utilizing their culture to highlight, you know, the past, but also look at the future. Great, thank you. Um, 2021 will be the 20th anniversary of the totem pole that you uh, conceptualized and built for Pelchak. Um, are there any plans for any celebrations for the 50th anniversary with the totem pole? I know that you're gonna be teaching um, in the summer. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, restoring the the um, uh, the totem to some degree, a fresh coat of paint, basically, um, just to kind of give it. You know, it's actually in really really good shape. You know, partly because um, the way that we installed it was actually quite brilliant. I thought because it um, when we stood it up, you know, there was like half half inch plywood that lifted it off the ground so up this you know a concrete pedestal and then we i created this rain hat a glass hat that you know protects the end grain of the totem pole so it hasn't sort of like become it hasn't wicked up all this moisture that is here in the northwest um so it's in really good shape um and we are exploring about you know pitching an idea to the school for making um you know commemorating the 50th, and there were, we're actually the, at the school, we're talking about the next 50 years. Okay, so what's the next 50 years gonna look like? You know, so we're, we're trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, we're thinking long-term, we're, we're thinking, you know, hoping that the, the school we, will be preserved and will continue, you know. And um, I have a proposal that is gonna be that they're looking at and they would like to create um, another gathering space, which I would like to uh, create this kind of a longhouse feel and have like a central fire pit, you know, that was up on the hillside where I, where we used to conduct sweat lodge ceremonies um, for this, you know, the, the uh, whoever was at on the campus in that session um, and uh, so we wanted to kind of transform that space and talk about like the, the ceremony that was done there and also kind of pay homage to, um, yeah, to the native culture and, you know, as uh, an opportunity for the school to have this place, you know, within the time of COVID, you know, there's a need for more outdoor space, you know, so this was part of the, the thought process, um, you know, uh, and so it kind of fits in with the, the uh, the needs for the school going forward, um, and so this is what you know we're we're hoping that we'll get you know some support behind it. I mean the the leadership of the school is all into all very much into it, so we just have to find the money to do it. So yeah. Um, okay. Um, 
So the late uh, Glass scholar, Paul Hollister, who we're, who we're focusing on in this project is from the East Coast. And a lot of stories we've heard have been about the East Coast. Um, but we're hearing more and more about the West, of course. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell me what you feel is special about the West Coast in Glass. Well, I think, you know, the, the Glass community here in the Northwest is, from my experience, having grown up in it. I mean, when I started blowing glass, it wasn't really, uh, there. it wasn't super uh, populated with glass artists or glass makers, you know. And over the years, it's grown tremendously. And about from about, from my awareness of 1982 on, um, it you know there's there's hundreds and hundreds of glass artists living in this region, and I think it's because, you know, one it's the climate. You know, you can blow glass here, and it never gets too hot. You know, really, um, uh, and and there's also the community, all the people. I mean, I work with several different artists that will you know I'll that work in different studios, and so when I'm making up my schedule, I'll have to incorporate you know maybe up to three extra people or four extra people. And so I will actually, um, uh, you know, have, uh, and depending on who's available. Um, so it's just, it's always been a really uh, supportive community and you've got all the technology and people working on equipment. You've got a lot of the supplies here. You've got, so it's just really geared up for, uh, for that. But it's also the camaraderie, you know, between the artists because it, it's, like the spirit of Pilchuck, it's always been um, a very open and sharing kind of experience. You know, you can bring your expertise to uh, to a particular uh, team. You know, what get, depending on what you're working on. So, um, I mean, I learned a lot about sculpting through working together with Ross Richmond, who was used to work with you know. Uh, uh, Billy Morris, you know, and he had, was very, you know, he's a very skilled car uh, sculptor, um, Ross is, and so he also helps me understand how to, how to manipulate the glass in such a way, and so that's really the big hallmark of this community, I think. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I know you became involved um, in glass through your friend Dante Marioni, who you mentioned earlier. Um, and whose father, Paul, was a major figure at Pilchuck yeah. and brought many of his techniques to the school. And you yourself learned under Lino Tagliapietra. Um, how important was learning international techniques to you and how are they carried over to what you're doing now? Well, you know, um, you know, first it was the just the the process of glass blowing itself and be, being comfortable with making larger pieces and smaller pieces and detailed pieces. I mean, I studied Venetian glass techniques very early on with Dante. I mean, we used to make cups together all the time. And so we watched Lino and we would sort of glean all of this technique off him. And he saw our enthusiasm and he was willing to share with us all of this uh, insights to making these objects and talking about the history of them. And this is from the 17th century and this is a more of a modern style. And so um, he was just super, super generous in, in sharing anything that we really wanted to know. Um, and so that was remarkable. Um, you know, then you've got like the Swedish, uh, I mean, Pilchuk becomes the meeting place. So I think that is brilliant unto itself because, you know, us who are here in the Northwest, everybody's coming to the Northwest and we are exposed to all of that. So that's another function of the, of the school um, that exposed us all to so many different kinds of techniques. And uh, that was, uh, you know, that was really crucial in the evolution of the glass process, kind of like the American, um, um, the Americanized approach to it, you know, to teamwork, to, um, you know, concepts to, um, to, you know, everything, all of the above. Great. Thank you. Preston, you came from a family of creative people. I know both your parents are musicians, were musicians, and your mother sewed and crocheted. Your dad uh, dabbled in oil painting, I believe, um, uh, soapstone sculpture, um, all sorts of things. Um, were you a maker in any capacity before you became a glass artist? 
you know, I was, uh, you know, there was music was my, my focus. I was really into, uh, music, uh, see any concert, major concert that was, would come through Seattle at the time you could get a concert ticket for six bucks. You know, <laughs> it's just sort of like, you know, now it's like, you know, uh, 75 or $250 to go see a show these days. And so, I mean, so that was my main interest. And like I said, the, the music was something that was, um, uh, the driving force, uh, for me, uh, you know, it, it took a bit of a hiatus. There was a bit of a lull in there, but then I came back this whole idea of doing, you know, interpreting native culture through music and working with native musicians. So that was, uh, that was pretty much it. You know, it's really just about, so that was my whole perspective about making things was all about 3D, 3D. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, 2D and it wasn't sculpture. It was like everything was in the round and all of that. Um, and so uh, there was a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, a metamorphosis there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I think that's a good way to end it. Thank you so much, Preston. Um, this was really fascinating. Um, I've been talking with Preston Singletary, an artist who works with glass. And for more, more information about Preston and other glass artists, please see our Voices in Studio Glass History Digital Project on the Bar Graduate Center website. Thank you. All right, thank you.